Hello, on today's showcase, King Tut designing wearable algorithms and suspense. Did Egypt break the law by putting priceless antiques on a world tour? Amnesia led this mathematician to become a fashion designer. Now for the climax of our tour. The inspiration and we take a look at Alfred Hitchcock's genre-defining classic, North by Northwest. The Egyptian government is under scrutiny over an iconic historical figure, King Tut. A lawsuit says Cairo broke the law when it organized a world tour for a number of antiques that belonged to the late pharaoh. Nursena has more. Starting in 2018, the exhibition Tutankhamun, Treasures of the Golden Pharaoh, was set to visit 10 cities, from the US to Japan, the UK to Australia, all until 2023. In late 2019, at the London opening, the Egyptian Minister of Antiquities himself talked about why his office organized such a big exhibition. We are very proud of our heritage. We are very happy to share it because we, do, we believe that we preserve the humanity heritage uh, and we have to share this with the whole world. That's why we are sending exhibitions abroad. We started sending exhibitions in the 60s of the last century and during the last three or four years we were sending exhibitions to Japan, Monaco, France, Switzerland, Germany, Italy, England, Canada, USA, uh, very soon the Czech Republic. We are very happy to send some of the exhibition as teaser to motivate tourists to come back to Egypt and then at the same time uh, to tell how we are proud with, of our heritage. However, according to a recent BBC investigation, the government may have illegally taken the treasures out of the country. Syed Said, an Egyptian lawyer, says some of those never-seen-before artifacts are priceless pieces that are protected by the law. In 2018, Syed filed a lawsuit against the Ministry of Antiquities, but the lawsuit is yet to be heard in court. And now, with the coronavirus backing up Egypt's court system, the case may be delayed indefinitely. Not to mention, the exhibition is permanently closed in London, and the next stop, if there ever will be one, that is, has yet to be disclosed. And mind you, this is not a small display. We are celebrating almost 100 years since the time of the discovery of the tomb of Tutankhamun. Second, it's for the first time Egypt allowed this number of artifacts to leave the country, 150 objects. And that's got some Egyptian lawyers saying, well, yeah, maybe there was a reason for that. Let's go to New York and talk to Leila Amine Dole. Her law firm specializes in art and intellectual property law. Hi, thank you so much for coming on our show today. So, uh, let's get to the bottom of the issue right away. Do you think that the Supreme Council of Antiquities in Egypt actually break the law? They may have broken the law, although it's going to be a challenge for the plaintiffs to prove that the Supreme Council of Antiquities actually broke the patrimony law in Egypt. Okay, that's interesting. Why do you think it would be hard to prove it? I think the problem here is that some of the terms in Egypt's cultural heritage laws are vague. For example, the law states that the government is not permitted to loan out unique items, but the law doesn't actually define what unique is. Mm -hmm. Okay, but according to the BBC documentary, the uh, law actually changed in 2018. Uh, it was amended in 2018, but then uh, they, uh, the Exhibitions International and uh, the Supreme Council of Antiquities in Egypt, they actually signed a deal before that. Do you think that it's makes true. a difference? Yeah. It's true. Well, the, the former law included the, the term unique. It's the current law that's not be, being broken. However, the exhibition began traveling prior to the amendment. So the exhibition breaks the former law, not the current one. Okay, so can you please tell me what other issues are there you think with the uh, law 
pre prior to the amendments in 2018. For example, I think it's said that uh, it could only be all these antiquities could only be exchanged with states, museums and scientific institutions, not private companies, whereas what was done was otherwise. Yes, that's true. So what the Egyptian government did is that they collaborated with a private company um, for this type of commercial exhibition. However, the law requires that loans only be made with other states or edu educational institutions like museums. Really, it goes, I think, to the spirit of the law that these antiquities are meant to be used for the benefit of the Egyptian people and really for all man mankind. The laws are intended to preserve works and to protect them. The objects of Egyptian heritage are intended to be exploited for commercial purposes and for the financial gain of members of the Supreme Council. Okay, so actually going back to the uniqueness point, which you think is vague in, in legislation, for example, in 2017, uh, for promotional, uh, you know, trailer for for this exhibition, um, Zahi Hawass, uh, the Egyptianist that that is uh, that is behind this project, he actually said that each object is unique. Whereas in the BBC documentary, he says that uh, these touring artifacts aren't of any importance. These are clashing, obviously, uh, statements, but do you think that could be used against them in terms of uh, the vagueness in law uh, defining uniqueness? Yes, it's, it's really funny that he kind of backpedaled on what he stated about the objects. In the promotional material, he tells how important the objects are, um, how special they are, and I think that once he got wind of this lawsuit and he learned about these problems, he went and said they weren't that important. Uh, and I think it's really interesting. I think that term unique in terms of these objects is a really interesting question. So in support of the government's position that they're not unique, they have stated that the works are part of a series of works. In fact, there are 5,000 objects that have come from King Tutankhamun's tomb, and there are only 150 of them on display. So I think that's a strong argument for the government to use, that they're not unique. However, on the other hand, I think any object that was found that's associated with King Tut has great interest for the public and is unique. So I, I think it'll be a really interesting discussion to, to see or litigation to watch if the case goes forward to see how the two parties argue about the nature of these objects. Okay, so uh, Syed Syed, the Egyptian lawyer he, who has filed a lawsuit against the Ministry of Antiquities, under the circumstances, do you think he's likely to succeed? Oh, that's such a difficult question. Um, there was a case involving artifacts associated with Cleopatra that the exhibition ended up closing early. So potentially that could happen again. Um, in the BBC documentary, one of the things that Syed had referred to was a lack of documents about this exhibition. I know he was looking for them and um, trying to discover some of the information from this prior case and he wasn't able to. Um, so it should be interesting to see if more information becomes available to him, how he would proceed with the case. Um, in light of the fact that a prior exhibition was closed early, I could, I could see that happening. I, I predict that it might happen, particularly because of the significance of these objects and their intended use. So another thing that was mentioned in the BBC documentary is that these artifacts were intended to be displayed in the Grand Egypt Egyptian Museum. Yeah. And that museum has its grand opening next year. Um, and the exhibition is intended to, to end, to stop in 2024. So I believe that in, I guess, in pursuit of opening the museum with all the artifacts, the Egyptian government or you know, the plaintiff in this case might put more pressure for the exhibition to be closed early. Okay, so if Syed Syed wins the case, then what? I mean, is it binding for all parties, like Exhibitions International, for example? Are they going to be imposed something? In the documentary, it's noted that the exhibition company was not party of the lawsuit. However, if a court states that the works need to be returned, 
there could be subsequent legal action that involves the exhibition company. Or I think a smarter move would be for the exhibition company just to agree to return the objects um, rather than getting involved in a legal scuffle and also harming the reputation for future exhibitions and future collaborations with Egypt, Egypt or other nations. Okay, so uh, before we wrap up, Leila, I mean, uh, the ministry actually says that they're promoting uh, their history and their, uh, you know, antiquities, which actually, you know, in return brings a lot of tourists and a lot of money as well. So why are some people so upset about what's happening? What are the risks actually of uh, lending these antiquities to other countries? I think that argument about tourism is flawed in some way. Um, it may kind of um, increase interest in Egyptian antiquities around the world, but at the same time, it could actually detract people from visiting Egypt. If they want to see the remains of King Tut, they want to see these amazing Egyptian objects, then they could visit the exhibition that's coming to their city or to their state or you know, to their country rather than travel to Egypt. But I think the bigger risk here is, well, Two, two things. One is that with any exhibition, there are always inherent risks. When objects are traveling, they could be damaged during the process, the travel process, or even the installation. So there's always a risk when an object moves, and that's one of the reasons there are such high insurance costs for these massive exhibitions. The second concern is really how the objects are being treated, that they're being treated for commercial purposes. And these are objects that are really important for Egyptian people, Egyptian citizens, um, and for future generations within Egypt and actually around the world. These are objects that are treasured. They, they really are the treasure of Egypt. And Egyptian people don't necessarily want these objects traveling around the world. They believe they are safer and they should remain at home and that they should be there for the people in Egypt, not necessarily traveling. Um, so I think some of the danger here is a cultural danger. All right, Leila Aminadole. It was very informative. Thank you so much for joining us on Showcase today. And now for a quick look at some of the stories from the world of arts and culture. New York artist Jane Valentas has passed away at the age of 76. She's most famous for restoring a single carousel near the Brooklyn Bridge, which led to the revitalization of the city's Dumbo neighborhood. Her leadership turned Dumbo from what has been called an industrial backwash into one of New York City's most expensive neighborhoods. For the first time ever, Christie's live-streamed a global relay auction and, for its efforts, raised more than $420 million. Hammers fell in Hong Kong, Paris, London and New York. Sales were led by Roy Lichtenstein's Nude with Joyous Painting, which ended up costing $46.2 million. Here's a much cheaper way to own a piece of art. Doc Martens has unveiled a new line of footwear featuring the work of New York graffiti artist Jean-Michel Basquiat. The collaboration shows off the painting's beat pop, dust heads and Pez dispenser. This isn't the first time Basquiat's estate licensed the late artist's work to a fashion brand. His pieces have also been shown on clothing by Supreme and Uniqlo. And finally, LA's Getty Museum is calling on its followers to pick their favorite artwork and recreate it. The hashtag Getty Museum Challenge produced all kinds of unique ideas by using just three household items. The museum says the activity is meant to keep people inspired at home while coronavirus cases continue to spike in the United States. A love of math took Diarro Busso from Senegal to a lucrative job on Wall Street. And then it was all wiped away. A car accident ended her career and left her with amnesia. It's only after that that mathematics unexpectedly directed her into fashion. And against all odds, she has this success story. Most designers need a firm grasp of geometry and algebra but Diara Busso takes it to another level. 
So that flower that we saw earlier can turn into this, to that, just by changing the variables. In this case, it's theta going from 0 to 12 pi. Busso creates algorithms that turn plot lines and curves into hand-painted shapes. It's something she discovered could be done when she joined a mathematics program at Stanford University. So, um, so yes, in all my free time, I would be drawing these parabolas and these lines and all these things we're learning and try to ask myself, why, did the kids, why should the kids care? And in the process of doing so, um, patterns would come up. So I'm graphing, doodling, and this is kind of what I would do in my free time when I'm in the train, when I'm sitting waiting at the restaurant. I'm just drawing, doodling, doing all these lines. And then I, like, when it would finish, I'd be like, wow, this is amazing. But then I can't create it again because it was all by hand on a piece of paper. And I have like hundreds of hundreds of hundreds of pages of papers like this. And I was like, what if I could save these somewhere? And what if I could have come back to the doodle and adjust it? What if I don't like the doodle and I want to change it? Busso launched her fashion line, Diarablu, in 2015. And last year, she won the coveted designer in residence at the San Francisco Fashion Incubator. Each shape can be represented by a mathematical equation. And now when you put all these equations together, you can create lots of lots of lots of shapes, which is nothing new. I think the part that makes this different is that when you can actually code it all and generate it with an algorithm, meaning that a process telling the computer, graph this line, graph this equation, find where they intersect, make it blue, do this, do that, do that, now the computer is drawing for you. But you have to sell it. I'm not using machine learning and AI yet. So right now, I'm still writing all the algorithms myself. But Busso says she's up against an industry that values what's in vogue based on AI and analytics. And despite being a numbers geek, she prefers to attach her work to the culture of her homeland. People like me don't get celebrated much in the industry. And when I have that opportunity, I want to make noise for all of us. And that's, that's the goal. That's the goal of the work I do. That's the purpose of, and that's why it's so important for me when I talk about algorithms. It's like, yes, but we're merging. We're merging algorithms and tradition. We're not just algorithms and like, that's it. Like I come from a place that deserves to be celebrated and it's the core of who I am and it's the core of what I do. Almost all of Busso's products are handcrafted in our Dakar workshop, and her designs have been featured in Vogue, Elle, and Glamour. Busso says she wants to use her newfound recognition to celebrate the work of those who are yet to be recognized. Russia is facing 6,000 new coronavirus cases a day and has said now's a good time to reopen the museums. The State Tretikov Gallery is taking measures to prevent visitors from spreading the virus, but will they work? Although the Russian health minister Mikhail Murashko has said that it's unlikely to go back to normal before February, one of Moscow's oldest art galleries, the State Tretyako Gallery, has reopened since the coronavirus pandemic closed it down in April. Russia has the world's fourth largest coronavirus case tally. The number of new cases in the country are on the decline. However, they still see thousands of new cases every day. Being closed for three and a half months was very difficult. It was difficult to close in mid-March in the midst of a great influx of visitors. We're strictly complying with all the measures. You have seen that at the entrance, we ask everyone to wear face masks and gloves. Everyone has their temperature taken. We are taking measures to prevent our visitors and staff from being infected due to violating rules and norms. The gallery welcomes the art lovers with an exhibition called Not Forever. It displays some 450 works depicting Russia's era of stagnation, which happened between 1964 and 1982. People in the 70s and 80s had a feeling that the era of stagnation would never end. So the name is a playful paradox. There was a feeling that it's forever, but nothing is forever. The era of stagnation is described as the negative way in which the economic, political and social policies of the period were seen in the Soviet Union. 
The aim was to create a complex, multi-layered project that will make you think about the artistic will of that time and see what is common within the works that were created in the framework of the official artistic concept and what was created by underground artists. Those artists during the era of stagnation, not many now you think about it, have created one of the most important artistic concepts of modern art. As well as socio-economic unrest, the freedom of expression, especially in the arts, were also under restrictions. And the exhibition, a first that depicts this particular historical era, tries to shed a light at the life controlled and censored by the communist rule. Sixty years ago, Hitchcock's classic North by Northwest was making its way to movie theatres around the world. It was the only time Hitchcock worked with MGM Studios. But the relationship produced one of the most influential pieces of work in the director's filmography. Here's Ali Jan with more. After The Man Who Knew Too Much, the lavish intrigue field drama he did with Paramount and his Warner Brothers thriller Dial M for Murder, dubbed a technical achievement in cinema, Alfred Hitchcock set his eyes on MGM to help him climb his next Mount Everest, the action Hello. film. Who is this? I'm not Mr. Kaplan. The project was North by Northwest, an epic about the search of a non-existing spy with a bit of mistaken identity thrown into the mix. For vacation romance. To make sure the film was a success, Hitch reached back to a winning formula from his British period two decades prior. Just like he did in 39 Steps or The Lady Vanishes, he mixed the espionage film with romance and comedy. But this time, Hitchcock had a bigger budget and stars with international appeal, like Cary Grant and Eva Marie Saint. Real landmark tourist locations like Mount Rushmore were used for travelogue value to add to the allure. The end result was nothing but surprising. North by Northwest was a success at the box office, with critics and audiences alike. But the biggest impact the film had on cinema was its visual language. The masterful shots that created the car chase scenes became thrilling spectacles. The ones that made up the pursuits on foot became thrilling moments. And the action scenes that were shot on famous locations became set pieces audiences kept talking about long after leaving theaters. I told you, I'm not Kaplan, whoever he is. During the 1920s with UFA Studios behind him, Fritz Lang also dabbled in similar cinematic visuals with Spioni. But it's Hitchcock's sense of fun and larger-than-life attitude that made other filmmakers turn to North by Northwest for inspiration. Her directions were easy to follow. James Bond borrowed visual aspects, such as shooting at tourist locations, and used similar chasing shots to create one of the most successful of spy film franchises in history. Now that espionage cinema evolved into the kind of entertainment that relies on tough and gritty content, it still can't escape the influence of North by Northwest, as the films of the genre still use the visual principles of a director, who's been long gone for decades. That's it on this episode of Showcase. Remember, we're on YouTube and Instagram and Twitter. Now, before we go, we'd like to pay homage to the 25th anniversary of the Srebrenica massacre. Every year around this time, thousands of coffee cups are filled in public squares. Here's a look at why. <laughs> 